If you like studying on the go, but don't have time to make your own flashcards or even trust the flashcards made by some random person online, then you're going to love the Straight A Nursing app. All 5,000 plus questions have been fully referenced and vetted by me to ensure you have the most accurate and up-to-date information. Study flashcards in more than 14 subject areas, whether you're new to your program or prepping for NCLEX. Go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash app to download and try for free from the App Store and Google Play Store. That's straightanursingstudent.com forward slash app. App.
Hello there, I'm Nurse Mo, and this is the Straight A Nursing Podcast, where I teach concepts and share tips on how to thrive in nursing school and the bedside. So happy you're here with me today. Very cool episode today that came about from a listener suggestion. So really happy to be able to bring that to you today. Before we dive into that, let's take a quick minute for a listener shout out that goes out to Nicole. And Nicole says, I love Nurse Mo's study sessions. They are great to listen to when I'm on the road or out on a walk, especially for material that is hard to wrap your head around and she breaks down the info into understandable, need-to-know explanations. I especially love the drills and pod quizzes for those hard-to-remember tidbits and lab ranges. Nicole, thank you so much for writing in to share your experience with my other podcast, which is the Study Sesh podcast, where I do all kinds of things to help you remember the key things you need to know for nursing school. You specifically mentioned the drills and the pod quizzes. So if you're listening, Nicole, you're going to love this episode today because we are going to be doing some pod quizzing. So if you're curious what Nicole is talking about, she is listening to my study sesh podcast. I'll put a link to that in the episode notes, or you can just go to my website and click on courses in the top menu bar. Okay, so I mentioned we would be doing some pod quizzing, but first let's go through the topic that we are discussing today. And I got a suggestion from a listener who wanted some clarification or some learning around eponymous terms. And eponymous terms are all those terms that are named after someone. So for example, Kuzmal respirations or Babinski reflex. Those are named after a person. And the word or the name doesn't really tell you anything about what it's associated with. So Unfortunately, this is just one of those things that you kind of have to memorize and learn as you go in nursing school. But I have gathered some of the most common ones. I'm going to go through them in alphabetical format. So not necessarily all the neuro ones together and all the cardiac ones together. We'll go alphabetically and then we'll do a little pod quizzing to see if you are able to remember some of the key things. And if you want to skip ahead to just the pod quiz component, then fast forward to about minute 23 and 30 seconds. Okay, so we're starting off with the Allen test, and this is associated with ABG analysis or arterial blood gas analysis. And what we do with this test is by obstructing the radial and the ulnar arteries, This test determines the presence of something called a palmar arch, which allows for blood flow to return to the hand should one of these key arteries become damaged. And in an arterial blood gas, typically we're looking at potentially damaging the radial artery. So we do something called the Allen test. Specifically, usually you'll see this as the modified Allen test. And in this test, the patient is instructed to make a tight fist if they're conscious and able to do so. If not, they skip this part. And then the radial and ulnar arteries are occluded by the tester. And then when the patient releases the fist, if they were able to make one, the hand should basically blanch or be pale in color due to blocked blood flow. The tester then releases pressure on the ulnar artery and watches for color to return to the palm. This indicates that if the radial artery were compromised during this arterial blood gas procedure, the hand would still get adequate perfusion. So that is the Allen test. Next, we have Babinski reflex, and this is associated with neurological injury, and it's also a normal reflex in infants. So When we test for the Babinski reflex, we're evaluating the corticospinal tract and is one way we test adults and older children for serious neurological injury. Up until age 24 months or so, the presence of this reflex is normal. However, if it is present in an older individual or an adult, this may indicate brain or spinal cord injury is present. 
Now, to perform this test, a blunt instrument is run along the lateral plantar surface, so the bottom of the foot, the lateral side, from the heel all the way up to the small toe, and then across the metatarsal pads to the bottom of the first toe. And I'm telling you, it's really, really irritating. You should try this. Have someone try this on you. It's it's not pleasant at all so that you can appreciate what our patients go through when we perform this test. A positive Babinski reflex is present if the toes fan outward or that first toe moves upward. That would be a positive Babinski reflex, and that's abnormal in an adult. Normally, what would happen is the toes curl downward. Okay, so that was Babinski reflex. Next, we have Barlow maneuver, and this is associated with developmental dysplasia of the hip. So you'll learn about Barlow maneuver in pediatrics. So to perform the Barlow maneuver, and I don't believe nurses do this. I think this is more a physician thing, but you do see this come up on tests a lot. So to perform the Barlow maneuver, the infant is placed supine, so lying on their back, with the hip flexed to 90 degrees. The observer grasps the infant's thigh and gently adducts the thigh without adding any downward pressure. The observer palpates the hip then to determine if the head of the femur moved out of the back of the acetabulum, basically if the hip was dislocated. Additionally, a thunk may be noticed when this maneuver is performed. The hip may also be subluxatable, which the observer may note as a feeling of looseness. So if the hip is dislocatable or subluxatable, this is a positive test and suggestive of developmental dysplasia of the hip. This test is often performed along with another test called the Ortolani maneuver, which we will get to further down in our alphabetical listing. Next is Battle's sign, and this is associated with neurological injury. So bruising over the mastoid process with or without associated raccoon eyes, which would be bruising around the eyes, indicates head trauma. Typically, it indicates blunt head trauma. It has a positive predictive value of more than 75% for a basilar skull fracture. However, interestingly enough, recent studies indicate it may also occur with hepatic encephalopathy without any head trauma. So again, this is battle's sign. You'll generally be learning about it as a sign of basilar skull fracture. Next is Beck's triad. Beck's triad is associated with cardiac tamponade. So Beck's triad is a group of three symptoms hypotension, jugular vein distension, and muffled heart sounds. Again, these are all associated with cardiac tamponade. Next up, we have biots respirations, and these are associated with neurological injury. So biots respirations are irregular with rhythmic periods of apnea lasting 10 to 30 seconds. Though it is generally due to neurological injury, this abnormal breathing pattern may also be present with opioid use, and that is called biots respirations. Next, we have Broca's aphasia, which is associated with stroke. So in Broca's aphasia, spontaneous speech is diminished, and the patient has difficulty with things like grammatical structure, prepositions, and linking words such as or or but. Individuals with Broca's aphasia can understand language and can get very frustrated with their difficulties communicating. So I found some examples on the National Institutes of Health website, which I thought were really good. So one of those was the person may say something like walk dog instead of I need to take the dog for a walk. Or they might say, cup, cup to table, instead of, there are two cups on the table. Broca's aphasia is considered a non-fluent aphasia. 
Next, we have Berger's test, and this is associated with peripheral artery disease. So this test evaluates for insufficient arterial blood flow. The observer elevates the patient's lower extremity until the veins have drained, essentially, and then the extremity is lowered, and the observer times how long it takes for blood flow to return to the patient's foot. So in a healthy individual, when you lift the leg, the foot stays the normal color that it is when it has good blood flow. Blood flow is not compromised. But in a patient with peripheral artery disease, they'll have pallor with elevation and a dusky flush when the foot is lowered. So that is Berger's test. Next, we have Shane Stokes respirations. And this respiratory pattern is associated with neurological injury and associated with heart failure. So Shane Stokes is a cyclical breathing pattern with periods of apnea and hyperventilation. It is often described as a crescendo and decrescendo type pattern. The pattern is due to fluctuating carbon dioxide levels, which can occur in patients with both neurological injury, such as a stroke, and in individuals with heart failure. If somebody has heart failure and they're exhibiting Shane Stokes respirations, this is considered to be indicative of very high risk for sudden cardiac death. Next is Jovstek's sign, which is traditionally associated with hypocalcemia. Though recent studies indicate that the clinical correlation between hypocalcemia and this sign is actually pretty minimal, it's still widely considered to be associated with hypocalcemia. However, a cross-sectional analysis conducted in 2023 showed that it may actually be more likely to indicate a normal or even elevated calcium level. With that said, most likely in nursing school, when you're tested on this, it's going to be about hypocalcemia. The sign is elicited by stimulating the facial nerve with the finger, basically flicking the facial nerve. If the ipsilateral facial muscles twitch, this is considered a positive sign, and ipsilateral means same side. Next is Cushing's triad, and this is associated with increased intracranial pressure. So when something is a triad, it's three things. So the three signs of increased intracranial pressure are a widening pulse pressure where the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure lengthens or gets bigger. So that's one, widening pulse pressure, two, bradycardia, and three, irregular respirations. Again, that is Cushing triad, and that is related to increased intracranial pressure. Next up is colon sign, and this is associated with pancreatitis, though there are other conditions. So colon's sign is a bluish discoloration around the umbilicus, and typically this is occurring in hemorrhagic or necrotizing pancreatitis. It can also occur in other conditions that cause bleeding in the abdomen, such as ruptured ectopic pregnancy, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, abdominal trauma, spleen rupture, and perforated duodenal ulcer. There are others. These were just a few examples. So that is Cullen's sign. Next is Koenig sign, and this is associated with meningitis. So to test for Koenig sign, the patient assumes a supine position with thighs and knees flexed. The observer then passively straightens the leg. Resistance to the leg being extended or pain that occurs in the lower back or the thighs indicates a positive response. So that is Koenig sign, and it's associated with meningitis. Next are coplic spots, and this is a sign associated with rubiola. So coplic spots occur in 60 to 70% of patients with rubiola or measles. And these are raised bluish-white spots on the buccal mucosa. Next, we have carotid cough sounds. And this is associated with blood pressure measurement. So carotid cough sounds are the pulsating sounds that are heard 
when auscultating the brachial artery during a blood pressure measurement. And the sounds occur due to the blood pressure cuff compressing that brachial artery, which causes the blood flow to be more turbulent and audible. So that is Karotkov sounds. This is what you're listening for when you're taking a manual blood pressure. Then we have Kuzmal respirations, and this is mainly associated with diabetic ketoacidosis. Though Kuzmal respirations can occur with any metabolic acidosis, like I just mentioned, mostly related to diabetic ketoacidosis, these respirations are characterized by rapid, deep breathing, and it's due to the body's attempts to rid itself of excess CO2, which is an attempt to maintain normal pH. Moving on now to McBurney's point. And McBurney's point is associated with appendicitis. So McBurney's point is located on the lower right side of the abdomen. Pressure is applied here to evaluate a patient with abdominal pain to see if it might be appendicitis. If pain is more intense at this location, that means it could very well be appendicitis. That was McBurney's point. Now we have Murphy's sign, and it is associated with cholecystitis. To assess for Murphy's sign, the patient takes a deep breath and holds it in while the observer palpates that right subcostal area. If pain occurs upon inspiration, this is due to the inflamed gallbladder coming into contact with the observer's hand. And again, that is Murphy's sign. Now we have the Ortolani maneuver, and this is associated with developmental dysplasia of the hip. So just like with the Barlow maneuver, in this one, the infant is placed in a supine position with the hip flexed to 90 degrees. The observer grasps the infant's thigh and gently abducts the hip while simultaneously lifting the trochanter in an anterior direction. And if the hip is dislocated, This maneuver may bring it back into the correct position, or what we say, reduce the dislocation. The Ortolani maneuver is generally utilized in coordination with the Barlow maneuver to dislocate and then reduce the hip. Next, we have Osler nodes, and this is associated with endocarditis. Found on the fingers and the toes, Osler nodes are thought to be caused by an immune reaction to infective endocarditis. Next up is Raynaud's phenomenon, also called Raynaud's syndrome or Raynaud's disease, and this is associated with the fingers and toes. This is a condition in which vascular spasms cause blood flow to the fingers and the toes to be reduced. These spasms occur in response to stress, even emotional stress, and exposure to cold. Then we have Romberg's test. This is associated with neurological disease. So the Romberg's test evaluates the area of the brain and the spinal cord that controls proprioception. In this test, the patient stands with their feet together with their arms either held down by their sides or crossed in front. The patient then closes their eyes and the observer evaluates their ability to balance. If the patient loses their balance, This is a positive test and indicates that there's some kind of neurological impairment or disease. Hopefully, someone is standing close by to catch them so that they don't fall. Next is Trousseau sign, and this is associated with hypocalcemia. So this test evaluates the patient for tetany associated with low calcium levels. A blood pressure cuff is inflated to 20 millimeters of mercury above the patient's systolic blood pressure and left in place for three minutes. A carpopedal spasm will occur in most cases of hypocalcemia and may also occur in cases of hypomagnesemia and metabolic alkalosis. But for the most part, we're looking at Trousseau sign to be indicative of hypocalcemia. Now we have Turner's sign and this is associated with pancreatitis, also called Gray-Turner sign. This manifestation is often seen along with colon sign in necrotizing pancreatitis and possibly other conditions that cause bleeding in the abdominal cavity. 
It is a discoloration of the flank, which may be greenish, yellowish, or purplish, depending upon how much red blood cell breakdown has occurred in abdominal wall tissue. Next up, we have UTOPS phenomenon, and this is associated with multiple sclerosis. UTOPS phenomenon is a temporary worsening of multiple sclerosis symptoms when the individual's core body temperature is increased. Then we have Virchow's triad, which is associated with DVT and pulmonary embolism. Virchow's triad is a collection of risk factors for the development of deep vein thrombosis, and then ultimately that can lead to pulmonary embolism. The three contributing factors are venous stasis, which comes with immobility. You have venous stasis when you're immobile. Vascular injury, so think things like surgery, and hypercoagulability. So that was venous stasis, vascular injury, and hypercoagulability. And then we have Wernicke's aphasia. And this is also associated with stroke. But unlike Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia is characterized by an inability to fully comprehend or understand language. So the result is maybe you might hear it referred to as word salad, where random words might be inserted. I found an example online at the National Institute of Health that said a person with Wernicke's aphasia might say, you know that smoodle pinkered and that I want to get him round and take care of him like you want before. As you can imagine, it's very difficult for this individual to express themselves and very difficult for others to understand them. So that is Wernicke's aphasia. And then lastly, we have another Wernicke, and this is Wernicke encephalopathy. And this is associated with thiamine deficiency. So Wernicke encephalopathy is a life-threatening neurological condition that incurs in patients who, again, have thiamine deficiency. This is often due to severe alcohol use disorder, but can also be associated with anorexia, hyperthyroidism, and hyperemesis gravidarum. The classic signs and symptoms are ophthalmoplegia, which is paralysis of the eye muscles. I hope I said that right. So that has nystagmus associated with it as well, ataxia, and confusion. So that was Wernicke's encephalopathy. Okay, we just went through a lot of stuff. Maybe some of it was new for you. Maybe a lot of it was review. But now I want to do a little pod quizzing. And what a pod quiz is, is it's a really great way to kind of study while you're on the go. You don't have to sit at your desk. I call it like flashcards for your ears. I will ask a question, give you a moment to respond, and then I will tell you the answer. Before we do that, let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back and we'll do some pod quizzing. As a busy nurse or nursing student, the one thing you can never seem to have enough of is time. And not just time to study or learn, but time to do the things that are good for you, like cooking meals at home. But meal planning and grocery shopping and prepping, they take a lot of time. And that's why I love Green Chef. With Green Chef, the meals are so quick and so easy. Plus, bonus, there's no grocery shopping. So you actually buy yourself extra time to do the things you really want to do. And yes, sometimes that is studying. Now for starters, the meals are really quick to make. Dinner meals can be ready in as little as 30 minutes. And lunch meals can be put together in just 10 minutes. Plus, they deliver everything you need to make delicious, wholesome meals right to your doorstep. Each meal organized, all nice and tidy for you in a little bag, already measured, sometimes already chopped. So you just grab it out of the fridge, follow the simple instructions, and bam, lunch or dinner is on the table faster than you can recite the Krebs cycle. And if you're wondering if it'll work for you and your specific dietary goals, Green Chef has got you covered with keto, plant-based, Mediterranean, calorie smart, protein-packed, and gluten-free options. 
They even have a category called quick and easy, and that one is my favorite. Just last week, I was able to grab a bag out of the fridge, and 10 minutes later, barbecue chicken sandwiches and coleslaw were on the table. So easy and so good. Go to greenchef.com slash 60 nurse mo and use code 60 nurse mo to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60 nurse mo and use code 60 nurse mo to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. All right, are you ready to do some pod quizzing? Let's get started. If an individual has Osler nodes, what condition do you think they probably also have? If you said infective endocarditis, you are correct. Good job. What is Murphy's sign associated with? What disease condition? Murphy's sign is associated with cholecystitis. Good work. And how do you assess for Murphy's sign? So with this one, the patient's going to take a deep breath while you're palpating over that right subcostal area. And if there's more pain with that inspiration, that's because the inflamed gallbladder is pushing into your hand, and that's very, very painful. Good job. What condition is the Berger's test used to evaluate? Peripheral artery disease. Very good. So I have got a patient and they're lying supine with their thighs and knees flexed. I'm going to passively straighten their leg and they have some pretty significant pain when I do that. What test am I assessing for and what disease condition is it associated with? So I am testing for the presence of a Koenig sign, and it is associated with meningitis. Excellent. That was a hard one. What about this one? I'm taking a manual blood pressure. What are the sounds I'm listening for called? Those are called Karotkoff sounds. What is the name of the test that the respiratory therapist is going to conduct before they draw blood from a radial artery for an arterial blood gas? That test is called the Allen test. What type of respirations are irregular with rhythmic periods of apnea that last 10 to 30 seconds. That was Biot's respirations. How am I going to assess for Chopstick sign? I'm going to flick the facial nerve with a finger and see if the facial muscles twitch. And what am I evaluating the patient for by trying to elicit this response? Hypocalcemia. Though, interestingly, the studies show the patient may actually be more likely to have this sign with a normal or even elevated calcium level. All right, let's talk about Cushing's triad. What are the three components 
of Cushing's triad. Widening pulse pressure, bradycardia, and irregular respirations. And what pathological process is Cushing's triad associated with? Increased intracranial pressure. Very good. What condition is Turner's sign associated with? Turner sign is associated with pancreatitis. What test is it often or what sign is it often also present with? Colon sign. And what is Turner sign? Describe what it looks like. It's going to be a discoloration of the flank and that discoloration can vary depending on how much red blood cell breakdown has occurred in abdominal wall tissue, but it's going to be greenish, yellowish, purplish. That is Turner's sign. What disease condition is Utah's phenomenon associated with? Multiple sclerosis. And what is Utoff's phenomenon? It is a temporary worsening of MS symptoms when the individual's core body temperature increases. What condition is Kussmaul respirations associated with? Diabetic ketoacidosis. And how would you describe Kussmaul respirations? It is rapid, deep breathing. And what is it? What is the body attempting to do with Kussmaul respirations? It's trying to get rid of excess CO2, it's trying to maintain pH balance. What condition is the Barlow maneuver associated with? Developmental dysplasia of the hip. What about Beck's triad? What condition is that associated with? If you said cardiac tamponade, good job. And you remember those three things that make up Beck's triad. One is hypotension. Another is jugular vein distension. And a third is muffled heart sounds. If your patient has spontaneous speech that is diminished and difficulty with grammatical structure and prepositions, what type of aphasia might they be having? Broca's aphasia. What about if they've had a stroke and they have aphasia, but they're just inserting random words into sentences? What type of aphasia is that? Wernicke's aphasia. Very good. Let's talk about another triad. Let's look at Virchow's triad. What condition is it associated with? Deep vein thrombosis, and then subsequently pulmonary embolism. So do you remember the three contributing factors for this triad? So they are venous stasis, or you might have said immobility. I'll give you credit for that. Vascular injury and hypercoagulability. What does the Romberg's test evaluate specifically?
It's looking at the area of the brain and spinal cord that control proprioception. And what kind of disease conditions is it looking at? Neurological conditions. Very, very good. What type of encephalopathy is related to thiamine deficiency? Wernicke encephalopathy. If I am inflating a blood pressure cuff and leaving it inflated for a few minutes to assess for a carpopedal spasm, what sign am I assessing for? I'm assessing for trousseau sign. And what abnormalities specifically am I evaluating? I'm looking to see if you might have hypocalcemia. What condition is the Ortolani maneuver used to evaluate? Developmental dysplasia of the hip. And what about McBurney's point? What condition is McBurney's point assessed in? appendicitis. Good job. Your patient has raised bluish white spots on the buccal mucosa. What are these spots called and what disease do they probably have? Those are coplic or coplic spots. I'm not actually sure which way it goes. And they probably have rubiola, also known as measles. And what condition is colon sign associated with? Colon sign is associated with pancreatitis. And where do you notice colon sign on the body? It's around the umbilicus. And what does it look like? It is a bluish discoloration around the umbilicus. My patient has bruising over the mastoid process. What sign is this? And what do I suspect they have? That is battle's sign, and I suspect a basilar skull fracture. If I take a tongue depressor and run it alongside the sole of the foot and then across the top of the foot, what am I testing for? I'm testing for a Babinski reflex. And let's say the toes fan out in my patient who is 48 years old. Is that normal or abnormal? That would be an abnormal response indicating severe, what kind of injury? Neurological injury. Very good. What type of respirations occur in a cyclical breathing pattern described as a crescendo and decrescendo pattern due to fluctuating carbon dioxide levels? That is Shane Stokes Respirations. And there you did it. You did a pod quiz. So if you found that enjoyable or helpful, then you definitely want to check out Study Sesh, where I have probably 80 or 90 episodes that are pod quizzes covering all kinds of topics for all of nursing school. Lots of students utilize it even to study and prepare for NCLEX. So I'll put a link in the episode notes. Of course, you can just go to straightanursingstudent.com, click on courses in the top menu bar, and it will take you to a page with all that information. So thank you so much for joining me on this week's episode of the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I had a lot of fun putting it together. I hope that you found it helpful as well. And then I will see you back here next week. We're going to dive into a quick little overview of some common drugs 
that you should know before your first clinical day. So I know you're, a lot of you might be heading into your first clinical day soon. It's good to know some key drugs before you go. So I will see you back here next week for that. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing, a proud member of the Airwave Media Network. For more educational podcasts, check out airwavemedia.com. And for more nursing-related content, go to straightanursingstudent.com. Have you ever wished that you had a direct line to your pediatrician to ask all the questions that constantly crop up while parenting? We sure have. That's why we launched the Bites of Health podcast. Every morning, we'll answer a commonly asked pediatric question in five minutes or less. You can tune in while you're making your second cup of coffee or from the school drop-off line. So be sure to tune in to Bites of Health, streaming now.